Yes, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr. Mullally. From Mr. Mullally, Asset. will you be good enough to come back into the witness box? Now, having excused you last time, Mr. Mullally, I think we need to uh, re swear you, I think. So, uh, it's, uh, you take an oath, do you not? Affirmation, please. Affirmation. Can you affirm the witness, please? I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly, sorry. I solemnly, I solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Mullally. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Collinson. Uh, Mr. Mullally, your full name is Timothy Peter Mullally. It is. Your position uh, with. ASIC is Senior Executive Leader of the ASIC Financial Services Enforcement Team? It is. Your business address is Level 7, 120 Collins Street, Melbourne? That's correct. You should have there, Mr Mullally, a copy of your summons to appear before the Commission dated 6 August 2018? I do. I'll tender that if you're on the process. Exhibit 5.309, the summons to Mr Mullally. <clears throat> uh, and secondly, Mr Mullally, have you got a copy of your witness statement dated 3 August 2018? I do. Uh, and is that witness statement true and correct? It is. Uh, I tend to that, Commissioner. The statement of Mr Mullally, 3 August 18, Exhibit 5.310. Yes, yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you. Mr Mullally, you've, in your witness statements, addressed some issues in relation to the obtaining of enforceable undertakings from ANZ and CBA? I do. And your evidence concerns the process by which those enforceable undertakings were obtained? It, it does. It, it concerns the discussions and negotiations that led to those enforceable undertakings. That's correct. And so that we can attempt to understand what the process is by which conduct of concern is addressed by ASIC. Each of ANZ, CBA and Westpac were identified as having in different ways gone about selling a superannuation product to consumers? That's correct. And they were selling that product not through financial advisors but through either call centre staff or front facing bank staff? That's correct. And as the issue with respect to Westpac concerned call centre staff? That's correct. And it's presently the subject of a reserve decision in the federal court? That's correct. So I'm not going to ask you any questions about that specifically, except insofar as it concerns what happened in relation to ANZ and CBA. In relation to ANZ and CBA, their conduct was concerned with bank tellers or staff members within a bank branch selling the superannuation products to consumers who came into the branches? That's correct. And each of them had a similar method by which that occurred, or one way in which it occurred, which was that the staff member would administer some sort of questionnaire to the consumer? That's correct. And in the case of CBA, it was referred to as the financial health check? That's right. And in the case of ANZ, it was referred to as the A to Z review? That's correct. And at the end of the carrying out of that questionnaire, the staff member would or might try to suggest other bank products other than superannuation to the consumer? They might do, yes. That's my understanding. And then the staff member was supposed to make a statement, which I think is sometimes referred to as a delinking statement, before talking about the superannuation product? Um, that's correct. So the delinking, I think in the ANZ matter, they refer to it as delinking um, CBA. I'm not sure that they use that term. At, th at that point in the process, there was a um, general advice warning given. But in any event, what has occurred sequentially is that the questionnaire is administered, the general advice warning is given, 
and then the consumer is told about the superannuation product. It's raised with them, that's my understanding, yes. And is ASIC's present view that if the process had been followed exactly as I have just described it, which is administering the questionnaire and then having the general advice warning and then just stating facts about the superannuation product without doing anything else, that there would not be an issue with that? No, we were concerned about that You would that still conduct. be concerned about that? Yes. And could you explain to the Commissioner then, so that he can understand ASIC's view on this, what the concern is if the process is followed properly? Well, our concern is that um, uh, the branch staff would be giving personal financial advice in circumstances where um, they neither had the training to do so um, and uh, were not authorised to do so. And are they giving personal financial advice merely by recommending the superannuation product? Um, no, it's the combat. Well, it's it's the whole process. So by taking into account, or um, if a reasonable person might think that they were taking into account the information that they'd gathered through the A to Z or the financial health check. So the point is, questions have been asked about the personal financial situation of the consumer, and the delinking statement or the personal advice. I'm sorry, the general advice warning is not enough from ASIC's perspective to separate the personal questions from the recommendation of the superannuation product? That was our concern, yes. And in that way, it would be personal financial advice? We were concerned that it would be, yes. Now, as we understand it, in 2012 and 2013, CBA came to ASIC and gave presentations to ASIC where it said that this is what it was going to do? I understand that there were presentations made to ASIC. I wasn't part of that process, so I, I can't comment on, on what those presentations were. Has ASIC retained copies of the presentations? I, I would presume we have, yes. When you were running the enforcement process in relation to CBA and ANZ, did you go back to look at what it was that CBA had originally told ASIC it was going to do? Our, our investigation team did look at that issue, yes. And it was the case, wasn't it, that CBA had said, one of the ways in which we are going to create interest for this product, or an interest, I think, is by using the financial health check? Um, I, I understand that to be the case, but I'm a little bit reluctant to be too um, uh, certain of that because I wasn't part of those um, discussions and, and for the purpose of our investigation we didn't really consider it relevant. Was it the case though that ASIC's view as to whether it was possible to have one of these questionnaires and then a general advice warning and then a recommendation of a superannuation product is something that has changed over time? I'm not aware of it changing. Um, as part of our investigation, I'm not aware that it was raised with us internally that this was a change in position. I see. And in 2014, ASIC first becomes aware or commences an investigation in relation to this type of conduct? In 2014, we commenced um, a surveillance in relation to this conduct, um, and that was a, a more thematic surveillance undertaken in relation to um, uh, the sales um, processes in relation to all the banks and uh, two other entities, I believe. And how did ASIC become aware of the conduct? Um, there was a complaint that was made and received by ASIC. Um, the exact details of that complaint I'm uncertain of. I understand it was um, concerning pressure sales within um, Commonwealth Bank. I see. But in any event, I think what you say in your statement is ASIC first became aware of the issue in May of 2014? I think that's correct, yes. 
and commenced a surveillance in June of 2014? That's correct. And then I think at the end of 2014, ASIC received a good governance notification from CBA? I believe that's correct, yes. Prompted by CBA had completed a number of rounds of mystery shopping in order to check whether its processes were being followed? That's right. And then you've explained that ASIC ended up issuing 42 notices in relation to the conduct? I'll, I, it was something along that line. In relation, I think, to both CBA, CBA and ANZ. ANZ. Yes. And they would have been more in relation to the other banks. And conducted 13 examinations? Uh, I think that's in relation to CBA as opposed to in total. I, see. I think there was more in total. More in total, did you say? Well, in relation to, I think it's in my statement, um, so 13 in relation to CBA and 7 in relation to ANZ. And within ASIC there is something referred to as the Wealth Management Project? That's correct. And the issue in relation to selling practices was being taken up to and reported to the members or the committee in relation to the Wealth Management Project? It became part of the Wealth Management Project, that's correct. And for example, if we can bring up ASIC.0015.0010.0837. This should be, if it's going to come up, the notes for the Wealth Management Project Board meeting on the 24th of April 2015. We might just have hard copies provided to Mr. Mullally, Commissioner, rather than while that's coming, rather than slowing it down. Commissioner, just give me one moment. If the document turns up, we'll show it to you, Mr Mullally. Otherwise, I'll just ask you some things and see how we go. The nominal start date of the project was the 11th of September 2014. Of the Wealth Management Project? of the project in relation to what's referred to as the mis-selling of my super products. Um, that sounds about right, yes. And do you recall that in April of 2015, ASIC had a target date for outcome, which was to issue proceedings by end October 2015 in at least one of three possible matters against CBA, ANZ or Westpac? That, that might be right. I, I wouldn't dispute that. Would you have been... At that stage, the manager was Marita Hogan? That's right. Does Marita Hogan report to you? She did. Uh, she did. Um, and uh, whether she was at that time, I'm, I'd have to sort of go back. So just perhaps a little bit of explanation. Um, there was some surveillance undertaken, and that surveillance was undertaken um, really within our stakeholder team, the financial advisor stakeholder team. Um, notwithstanding that was within that team, it was still funded out of the wealth management project and still reported through that um, line of reporting. 
Um, I, my recollection is that by around that time, Marita would have been reporting to me. Now, Commissioner, what I'll do, I think, is rather than slowing us down now, I will tender some board meeting documents and then at some stage they will, somebody will produce a copy and give them to you. Do you want me to give you the name of the document now so I can indicate what I'm tendering? Yes. It is the Wealth Management Project board meeting papers for the meeting dated 24 April 2015. The doc ID. Commissioner, the doc ID is ASIC.0015.0010.0837. And will become Exhibit 5.311. The Wealth Management Project would have a meeting every month? It did, yes. The board had a meeting every month, yes. The board for the Wealth Management Project? That's correct, yes. And I want to suggest it met again on the 20th of May 2015. That's quite possible, yes. And at that time, the target date for outcome in relation to this mis-selling of my super projects was to issue civil penalty proceedings by the 30th of October 2015. Um, I don't doubt that that's what's on the report. And I'll tender that document as well, Commissioner, and. Again, it will come up at some stage. It is ASIC.0015.0010.1324. It is the papers for the Wealth Management Project Board meeting of 20 May 2015. That will become Exhibit 5.312. And do you know whether or not ASIC managed to institute any proceeding by the 30th of October 2015? Uh, no, it didn't. Do you know why not? Um, the matters were still under investigation. We needed to continue to do work in relation to those matters to get the evidence that we needed, to get the advice that we needed. Um, the wealth management team was looking at a whole range of matters, many of which have been agitated through the course of these uh, Royal Commission. So we were looking at fees for no service. We were looking at uh, conduct by advisers. We were looking at poor advice matters. Um, there was a fair bit of work that the team was doing and they were working their way through it. If the view of ASIC was that administering the health check or A to Z review, and then making an offer of a superannuation product was a contravention of the Corporations Act because it was personal financial advice. What was the evidence that needed to be gathered? Um, well, we needed to, um, I suppose, understand exactly what the process that was being going, going through by the relevant banks um, so we were collecting evidence in relation to the interaction between bank branch staff and um, evidence from the uh, customers themselves. So we were doing section 19s to get that information and evidence. We were seeking information from the banks about their processes, about what had been put in place to mitigate any risk. Um, just, it's the usual sort of investigation where you need to understand properly the evidence. Um, and uh, by the time, and I think, again, it's in my statement sometime, prior to October 2015, we sought advice from senior counsel. Um, and we, we take guidance from counsel in relation to the sort of evidence that we might need to be able to uh, get a case in court. But just, if you think this through, you're obviously at least experienced in conducting investigations in relation to matters that might potentially go to court. Yes. You know that the allegations that you are outlining to us here are that the process that each of ANZ and CBA admit that they used, which was 
a financial health check or A to Z review, followed by a general advice warning or delinking statement, followed by an offer of superannuation, is something that you think contravened the Act? We certainly were concerned about that. Um, they, the, the banks admitted to the conduct in terms of the steps that they were taking. Yes. They certainly didn't admit that they were breaching the law. And in fact, they've never admitted it. No, that's right. But you see the facts, they admit. Do you agree? Oh, they admit the facts, yes. yes. And then you need to go to a court to determine whether as a matter of law it is a contravention. Yes, and we've gone to court. And you, well, you've gone to court in relation to Westpac. Yes. Where Westpac is doing something slightly different over the phone. Slightly different, yes. And I just want to make sure I've understood, though, your view, that is the view of ASIC since at least 2015, I assume, is that the questionnaire followed by an offer of superannuation, even though there's some interposed delinking statement or personal adv or general advice warning, is not sufficient to transform that conduct from general advice to personal advice. That's correct, yes. And therefore, that every time the banks do that, they are breaching the law. Um, well, not, no, not necessarily every time, because each particular circumstance, each time a bank branch staff member undertakes um, the questionnaire and has the interaction with the um, customer, um, it, it may or may not be in breach. It's not, it's not we, did, we didn't take the view, in a sense, that um, uh, each case would end up as being personal advice. We, we took the view that we needed to understand some individual cases to make the call about whether or not, in fact, there was personal advice being given. This is a matter that has not been tested at all, whether or not uh, or, uh, um, the differentiation between personal and general advice. Um, these were complex matters. They were matters that we did get advice on um, prior to contemplating the issuing of proceedings, and that advice was uh, um, to the effect that there was some significant risk. Yes, but you're the regulator. Yes. And you have a view about what the law is. Yes. And there's always going to be a risk, and sometimes yes. it'll be significant and sometimes insignificant. Yes that when you go to court, a court will not agree with you? Yes. Surely the fact that there is a risk that the court will not agree with you is not a reason to not go to court? No, and, and we have many matters before the courts where we're concerned about whether or not the, the court will agree with us. Um, and we had a matter before, we took a matter to the court in relation to this particular issue about the um, provision of general or personal advice. We had that matter there. It was a test case. It is a test case. As you've indicated, decisions reserved on it. Um, you know, we've taken that matter. It's a test case, though, that doesn't involve the administration of a questionnaire followed by the selling of superannuation. No, but it, the principle we see is being tested, which is whether or not in the circumstances of these sorts of sales there's general advice or personal advice given. And so that I can understand what your evidence now seems to be, re recall at the beginning of your evidence, you seem to agree with me, I thought, that ASIC believed that administering the questionnaire and then offering superannuation even if there was a general advice warning and delinking statement in the middle, was still personal financial advice. That was our concern and, and still is. And what we were trying to achieve and what we did achieve was the conduct stopped. But? And we have a matter before the courts where we can test the proposition. But you don't have a matter before the courts where you can test the proposition because the matter before the courts doesn't have anything to do with administering this questionnaire. Yes, I understand what you're saying, and if, if we took the proposition that each small difference or difference um, 
where the principle is the same, but a different attempt to get to that same end, um, that we needed to test every single one of them through the courts, um, we'd be clogging up the courts for ever and a day. So in about August, I'm sorry, in about July of 2015, the target date for the issue of civil penalty proceedings gets pushed back to 30 November 2015. I, I don't doubt that that's on the report. Commissioner, I'll tender ASIC.0015.0004.0682, which is the papers for the Wealth Management Project Board meeting of the 2nd of July 2015. That document will be 5.313. And eventually ASIC commences a proceeding against Westpac when? I think it was December 2016, I believe. I see. So it's about 18 months ago. And then at the beginning of 2017, ASIC is continuing an engagement with ANZ and CBA? So I think in December um, 2016, in relation to both ANZ and CBA, we put a position paper to them. Um, Where ASIC said, we consider your conduct to involve various contraventions of the law. That's correct. And at least in the case of ANZ, ASIC had a concise statement drafted. So sometime after then, I think about April or May of 2017. And a concise statement is the document that is drafted in support of an originating application to be filed in the federal court. That's correct. So at that stage, in the first half of 2017, ASIC is at least at the point of commencing a proceeding against ANZ? Yes, I think it was about the 10th of May. And what about against CBA? Uh, I'm not aware that um, a concise statement was drafted for CBA. Um, but around about that time, we were coming to similar conclusions um, well, no, so I, I, I retract that. Our concern in relation to A and Z is the response that we received from them in relation to our position paper um, was essentially a denial. Um, and there was no movement. And at that point, we thought we needed to say to them, you know, unless we're able to sort of move this, we will proceed with um, court action. I think in relation to CBA, uh, there was more uh, movement by CBA in relation to the concerns that we had. CBA were willing for ASIC to put out a media release? Uh, I think, oh, well, they, they may have been. My recollection is that they made some form of offer, um, which may have included issuing, ASIC issuing a media release. Um, in relation to it, but we didn't consider that that offer was satisfactory. And ultimately they indicated they were prepared to enter into an enforceable undertaking? Um, both ANZ and CBA indicated that. Can I suggest to you that as at about January of 2017, or early February 2017, ANZ, I'm sorry, ASIC was looking to settle a statement of claim against ANZ in the following month. So that is in February. Early, um, yes, that, that, I, I can't dispute that. I'm in February of 2017, it's looking to settle a statement of claim in March of 2017? Yes, it might be right. And then ultimately that becomes a concise statement 
And when did you think that was ready? Uh, my recollection is sometime late April, May of 2017. I had thought that there was correspondence on about the 10th of May 2017. Sorry, I'm just getting the folder I need. And just so I understand then, you've drafted a concise statement. And have you drafted a concise statement with the intention of commencing a court proceeding? Um, the intention was to ensure that A and Z were aware that if we weren't able to resolve the matter um, outside of court, that we would go to court. Had you drafted the concise statement with the intention of commencing a proceeding? Um, if it was necessary, we would have commenced the proceeding, yes. And I feel like I'm not understanding ASIC's processes. When you say if it was necessary, what was the alternative to commencing a proceeding? To resolving the matter outside of court with ANZ. By an enforceable undertaking? By a court enforceable undertaking, yes, if that was possible. So the drafting of the court proceeding is a negotiating tactic to try to get ANZ to move towards an enforceable undertaking? It was part of the process that we undertook, yeah. We saw it as a, a, a tactic that we could use. And it was not a false threat. That is, if they really refused to give an enforceable undertaking, we would have, have commenced. Yep. And was there any time limit on that? I think we said within 24 hours. If they didn't indicate that they were willing to give you an enforceable That's undertaking. That's correct, yes that you would then commence within... Tw I, think, I think it was 24. Yeah. I'm sure you've got the, the document or detail there. I feel like we might be at cross purposes. Can we bring up ASIC.0041.0001.7093, which is exhibit number six to Mr Mullally's statement? So this is an email sent from ASIC to ANZ on the 10th of May 2017. Yes. And it's attaching the concise statement. Yes, I, I understand. concise statement. Yes. And the statement made in the email is, ASIC intends to commence proceedings on Monday 15 May 2017 we note that ANZ and ASIC have been in discussions regarding this matter since September 2016. If ANZ is prepared to make admissions regarding the contravention set out in the concise statement, please inform us by return email by close of business on Friday 12 May. Yes. Yes. And <coughs> then it also asks, please also provide us with details of solicitors ANZ has appointed to act in this matter and confirm whether they hold instructions to accept service? Yes. And this was a, a bluff, was it? In the sense that you weren't actually going to commence proceedings if they would agree to give you an enforceable undertaking? Um, well, if we could get an agreed um, court enforceable undertaking from A and Z, we thought that that was going to be a better outcome than commencing proceedings, yes. What you told them was you're going to commence proceedings. Do you agree? Oh, well, I think that's what, well, the email, it's, um, yes, but ASIC did say that, yes. And presumably by then the ASIC the commission or the enforcement commission committee, somebody must have resolved that we are going to commence proceedings. I think the commission would have, or the appropriate committee would have agreed that 
if it was necessary, we would commence proceedings, yes. And <coughs> what you asked ANZ to do was to say whether it was prepared to make admissions on the contraventions set out in the concise statement. Yes. But what you're saying to the Royal Commission is you weren't actually looking for admissions, you were just looking for them to say they'll provide an enforceable undertaking. This is, um, if they had have wanted to fight this matter in court, we would have gone to court. If they wanted to make admissions prior to us filing or after we filed, that was up to them. We also considered that there was um, a matter where if we could resolve by way of non-court outcome, that was in the best interests of consumers in particular, um, and it was a, a way, a, an appropriate way to resolve the matter. And this was? And this is, this is part of a, a process where we need to ensure that ANZ understood, and they did understand, that we were serious. Do you think that financial institutions might take ASIC more seriously if when it drafts a concise statement, says it's going to file it, it actually follows through and does it? Well, we do that all the time. But your point is here, when you did it, you didn't actually mean it. No, we would have filed if we hadn't had the response that we wanted and we got the response that we wanted. You got a response on the 12th of May 2017 from ANZ, which is ASIC.0041.0001.7107. <coughs> That's exhibit TM-8 to Mr Mullally's letter um, to Mr Mullally's statement. So this is the letter that you got in response? I understand, yes. Yes. It came to you? Well, there was two letters, I think. There was an open letter and a without prejudice letter. I see. And the open letter didn't, I'm sorry, the without prejudice letter didn't offer an enforceable undertaking? Uh, no, it didn't. It complained that ANZ was surprised and disappointed to be informed in a telephone call on 10 May 2017 that ASIC was no longer proposing to complete the process in the way that had been contemplated? It does do that, yes. And it then proposed that there be a mediation to try to facilitate agreement? Uh, a meeting? Yes, and then you see in the last paragraph, we think that might oh, best be facilitated yes. by involving a mediator. Yes. And the open letter talked about a mediator? It may have done, yes. I'd have to remember. So on the 12th of May, the deadline that ASIC had imposed on ANZ, there wasn't an agreement to provide an enforceable undertaking? No. And then on the morning of the 15th of May, you received an email from the Group General Council of ANZ? I believe so, yes. That's ASIC.0041.0001.6002. This is an email from Mr. Santa Maria to you? That's correct. And you already knew Mr. Santa Maria? Yes, I do. And how did you know Mr. Santa Maria? Um, I had dealt with Mr. Santa Maria um, in relation to the investigation of Opus Prime, the collapse of Opus Prime, um, and had quite substantial dealings with him during that period of time. Um, and subsequent to that, had kept in touch. And he said, I can well imagine the many pressures on you with such cases, but can I add my own request 
to that from Lawrence that we get a chance for one final chat before ASIC commences the proposed prosecution? Yes. And I tend to that email, Commissioner. Email from Mr. Santa Maria to Mr. Mullally, 15 May 17, concerning Smart Choice ASIC 0041 0001 6 002, Exhibit 5.314. Now, so that I understand, at this stage, ASIC has said in writing to ANZ, we're going to commence a proceeding on the 15th of May 2017. Yes. It hasn't been qualified or conditional in any way, the statement that was made to ANZ? Not that I'm aware of, no. You're saying what ASIC was actually looking for was for ANZ to say, we're prepared to give an enforceable undertaking. We're looking for a response from ANZ. And I think it shows that when the Greek General Council starts engaging in the process, we've got their attention. You've got their attention. Is that honestly what you regard as a successful application of the regulatory process? I'm not sure what you mean. Having told them that you were going to commence on the 15th of May 2017, you then didn't commence on the 15th of May 2017? No, we haven't commenced at all against ANZ. And why did you not commence on the 15th of May, as you'd said you would? Because we'd been contacted by ANZ who indicated they wanted to engage in the process of resolving the matter. And I, at, the, at the very, I mean, the focus of this was to stop the conduct. We wanted the conduct to stop. And that's what happened. We were able to achieve that. We were able to achieve it in a very timely way without having to go to court. On the 18th of May 2017, there was a meeting between ASIC and ANZ? That's correct. I'm sorry, can I just go back? Did you just say in a timely way? That's correct. You had a proceeding drafted in May of 2017? That's correct. You entered into an enforceable undertaking with ANZ in, at the end of July 2018? That's correct. You had begun investigating this in June of 2014. That's correct. Surely you don't believe that that is a timely resolution. What I'm saying is, um, and I'll certainly um, concede that we need to do things quicker. However, there was no guarantee that if we had have gone to court in May 2017, that we would be anywhere near resolving the matter. And, you know, it's of no, I mean, absolutely no disrespect to the court at all. These matters take time through the court. They take time. And the, the experience of the Westpac matter, and again, no disrespect to, it, to the court, is that it takes time. Well, you commenced it in December of 2016. You had a trial in February of 2018 and judgment is presently reserved. That's correct. And you also said, I think, the conduct has now stopped? Well, there's some period of time after the signing of the EU to allow ANZ to put in place the proper processes that they need to to ensure that um, they're, they're able to stop the conduct. Now, um, there was, in our view, um, we needed to give some amount of time for those processes to be in place. Otherwise, they would have been in breach of the, the EU from day one. Do you that's, think that's not <laughs> pragmatic. And if a court made an order, would there be any time to give effect to it except at once? Um, it, it, that might be the case, Commissioner, that the court might say it must stop there and then. The court may also make an order that it allows some time. Go you could have, presumably, commenced a proceeding and sought an interlocutory injunction to prevent them engaging in the conduct pending the outcome of the trial. 
we could have, and we gave serious consideration to that. Um, we sought advice in respect of that, and the advice in our consideration was that it was futile. We wouldn't have got that order. It wouldn't, you know, the balance of convenience would have been in favour of the bank. You spoke to, I'm sorry, ASIC spoke to ANZ on the 18th of May 2017? There was a meeting. I wasn't present at that meeting. You've seen the file note of it? I have, yes. And on the 18th of May 2017, ANZ's position was that they don't believe that they have behaved in contravention of the regulations or the law? ANZ have held that view all the way through. They continue to hold that view as far as you know? Um, I don't think that they've ever admitted that they're in breach of the law. They acknowledge that our views are well founded and that's as far as they're prepared to go. Well, that your view, you have a reasonable concern. Yes. So nobody has ever resolved whether this conduct is or is not unlawful? No. There is a matter before the courts, though. About a decision reserved. Different conduct. Yeah, slightly different, yes. All right. And then when does ANZ say to you that they're prepared to accept an enforceable undertaking? Uh, I would have to uh, refresh my memory on the exact date at some time after 18th of May. I think it's, if you have a look at exhibit TM-11 to your statement, it looks like it's in a without prejudice letter dated the 26th of May 2017. Yes. And as we understand it, under the guidelines that ASIC publishes, it will only accept an enforceable undertaking in certain circumstances. That's correct. And those circumstances have to be that ASIC is satisfied that it can achieve some better or additional outcome from an enforceable undertaking as compared to what it could achieve in a court? That's right. And, sorry? Essentially, that's right, yes. And in this case, what was the better outcome that ASIC thought that it could achieve? Well, we thought that we could get the conduct to stop. We could get the conduct to be, um, or in, uh, agree with ANZ in a sense that they take two steps back from the line um, rather than just behind the line in terms of what was general advice and what was personal advice. So we were able to do that through an EU, which was not necessarily what can be achieved through a court process, um, and we could do it in a more timely way. Just so we can make sure we understand, we agree that if you'd gone to court, run the proceeding, and succeeded, the end outcome would be that you would get an injunction to stop the court, almost certainly. Well, or at least the conduct will stop. Yes, yes. And you also would have been able to obtain a civil penalty against ANZ? Um, most likely, yes. And that would act as a deterrent to them and to others from engaging in the conduct? Yes. And so the reasons why you preferred an enforceable undertaking were because you thought you could stop the conduct in a more timely way? That's one of the reasons, yes. And sorry, what was the other reason? That we could agree with them um, uh, what it is that um, was acceptable or not acceptable behaviour. So we, we could be more prescriptive in the EU than we might otherwise have got through a court process. So, for example, if the court had uh, made declarations that there was a contravention, um, the bank or others might set up a process that's just somewhat slightly different from um, the manner in which this conduct was occurring. And we might then be in a situation where we have to go through a process of um, understanding whether that new conduct was in breach of the law or not. And we, we determined that the better outcome was to say, you cannot do this. You cannot have um, a some form of questionnaire, financial health guide or financial health questionnaire or an A to Z guide, etc. And we stopped that. If the reason that there was a contravention of the prohibition on personal financial, uh, the prohibition on ANZ's bank staff giving personal financial advice is because the recommendation of the superannuation product happened in conjunction with the questionnaire, 
then that would all be stopped by the court proceeding, wouldn't it? Um, that specific conduct would be, that would be declared to be in breach if we were successful. Yes. Um, but I think what we learned through the whole of this investigation is that um, all the banks were trying to find ways in which they thought they could continue to do the health check or the A to Z, still have a discussion about superannuation um, in a way that they hoped we would say wasn't um, in breach of the law. And we continued to have those, you know, they were making changes to their processes along the way, which is one of the reasons this was more complex than it perhaps sounds. Um, and we, we wanted to stop that um, completely, and we did. We, again, you still haven't stopped it completely. Well, at the end of the period of time, I think it was, I'm not sure whether it's two weeks for CBA and 45 days, I think, for ANZ, it'll be stopped. And one of the things that both banks did was to try to make sure that the way in which the enforceable undertaking was framed was very specific about what conduct they were agreeing to stop. Um, yes, that, uh, I think, and you know, the, the whole process of negotiation again, which is one of the reasons that it took such a long period of time, was they were trying to have included in the um, in various versions of the EU or draft EUs, you know, us agreeing to what they could do, and we were trying to push back on that, and we did. But the end result is enforceable undertakings that are very specific about what is prohibited. Would that's you, yes, go on. Well, that's correct. Yes, I was going to say that's correct. Wouldn't that be exactly the same outcome that you would expect from a court? Um, it's, well, our judgment was that there was risk involved in going down that, that um, process. So, on the 26th of May 2017, ANZ makes a proposal to you that they would accept an enforceable undertaking or they would enter into an enforceable undertaking? That's correct. And you responded to them on the 27th of July 2017? That's correct. It seems, yes. You would describe that as timely? No, I think that takes too long, but I would need to understand what happened in between. Um, What's well, your letter, Mr Mullally, that you send back on the 27th of July I don't, I'm not disagreeing that it's my letter. What happened between those two dates, I don't know. Um, I suspect that we would have had to have internal consultation about the specifics of the offer that was made by ANZ. We would have had to talk to the right people within ASIC, including the Wealth Management Board and potentially the Enforcement Committee, um, to get... Uh, 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 in a sense, approval as to what the response should be. Don't doubt it. I understand what you're saying is it's we need to do better. We need to be quicker. And then you exchange... I'm sorry. ANZ writes back on the 7th of August 2017. That's correct. And then ASIC writes back on the 15th of August 2017. Yes. And then, I think this might or might not be missing from your exhibits, but in any event, there's then a letter that ANZ sends back on the 18th of August 2017. 18th of August, yes. And then you write back on the 14th of September 2017. I don't have that, but yes. I'll tender that letter, Commissioner. It's a letter of the 14th of September 2017 from ASIC to ANZ. It's ANZ.800.973.0466. That document is Exhibit 5.315. And then in October of 2017, you send a draft enforceable undertaking to ANZ? I think that's correct, yes. And, and is that the first draft proffered by ASIC? I, I believe so, yes. Well, it is, yes, Commissioner. So it's taken from uh, the outset of negotiations until this point for ASIC to say to ANZ, here is what we want. That's correct. Why? Um, Surely you begin these negotiations with an understanding of what ASIC wants. 
we we have a, 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 certainly an understanding of what we want in the broad and term you, of them. You just get a proper understanding of what you want by writing it down in the form of a draft undertaking, don't you? Um, the process that we took was to set out, I suppose, in letter form, the high level um, matters that we wanted them to agree to. Um, what ended up, and, and it is, as I said before, one of the complexities of this particular matter is it turns on um, some uh, uh, clauses or um, expressions such as, you know, there was concerns about whether something was in conjunction with something. And, um, you know, we were having uh, discussions with uh, and negotiations with ANZ and indeed, I think, with CBA at the same time, um, along not, those lines. Is it not an essential first step for the regulator to determine what it wants from the particular member of the regulated community? Well, I think we did set that out to them, that we is did it in letter form. Level? Yes. Yes. Go on, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. And one thing you did try to do initially was to frame the enforceable undertaking a little bit more widely so that it would prohibit a needs-based discussion, which was defined to be in the first draft by ASIC, any discussion with a customer which involves the customer providing information about one or more of the customer's objectives, financial situation and needs otherwise than for the purpose of compliance with the Anti-Money Laundering Act or with regulations? Um, I'm assuming since you're reading that, that's what's in the document. But that I was mean, I, yes, I'm not disagreeing. Originally, what ASIC was looking to do to try to achieve something was to prohibit the conjunction of any needs-based assessment with the selling of superannuation. Yes. And then ANZ pushed back and said, we don't agree to that. We'll only agree to something that is similar functionally to the A to Z review. Um, there was a lot of negotiations in relation to this EU. Um, I don't doubt what you're saying, um, I, but I, I, I'd have to be taken to the correspondence and communications. Well, let's look at how it started. If we bring up ANZ.800.973.0589 on one side of the screen and on the other side of the screen ANZ.800.973.0590, Do you want the doc ID again? I'll just read out what it says and we'll tender the document. In the draft sent by ASIC on the 3rd of October 2017, it defined needs-based discussion to mean any discussion with a customer which involves the customer providing information about one or more of the customer's objectives, financial situation 
and needs otherwise than for the purpose of compliance with the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act 2006 or with regulations or AML slash CTF rules under that Act? Yes, I can see that. So that's in TM26, I think. And ANZ pushed back on that. And if we bring up the final version of the undertaking, which is exhibit TM-27 to your statement, it's ASIC.0041.0001.3343. And go to the second page. We see by the end, ANZ had managed to get a definition which was needs-based discussion means any discussion with a retail client regarding their financial situation and needs which is similar in substance to an A to Z review. That's correct. And can you say that your view is you managed to obtain something in this enforceable undertaking that went beyond what you would have obtained if you got an injunction at the end of a court proceeding? Um, well, we believe that we, we have, yes. We've had the conduct stopped. We've indicated what it is um, that they cannot do. So we've, we've stopped that conduct. Um, and to the extent that they've got any other sort of process in place that they want to um, undertake similar conduct, we've got a monitoring process to ensure that it complies with the law. How much was the community benefit payment that they finally agreed to? Um, they made very early on an offer of $1 million um, and they also offered to pay ASIC's costs of $250,000, costs of investigation. Um, we don't accept and can't accept costs of investigation when we accept EUs. Um, we combined the amounts and that was the amount that was agreed. That is, they agreed to make a community benefit payment of $1.25 million? That's correct. And do you recall or are you aware that one of the things, I, uh, one of the things that ASIC tried to do was to have some factual contextual information included in the enforceable undertaking so that people would know what the value of funds were? Yes, that were that's invested? correct and they d provided a draft at one stage of the undertaking that included that information? And included it for a period of time, yes. I'm sorry, what? I think it was limited to a particular period. It might not have been for the whole, whole of the, the um, time that they were engaged in the conduct up to that point in time of the EU. For some reason, I think it was just a, a smaller period of time. I think it was in excess of $583 million at that point. Yes, for a particular period of time, the funds under management that ANZ had managed to get via the conduct was close to $600 million. That's correct. And ANZ said, we won't agree to that fact going in? I understand, yes. And so ASIC took it out? That's correct. And letters went back and forth between the parties through until June of 2018? That's correct. And then finally, the enforceable undertaking was signed at the beginning of July 2018? That's correct. And with CBA, CBA, did it try to call Mr Kell, do you know, to see whether they could get a media release rather than enforceable undertaking? Um, if, I think there was a meeting in, um, early November 2017, at which time the ANZ, uh, sorry, CBA were um, indicating that they didn't want to uh, resolve the matter by way of an EU, yes. They wanted to, you, you recall at some time CBA wanted to resolve it by media release? I think that was earlier, but yeah. And then do you recall that at some stage CBA tried to get ASIC to agree to postpone the EU until after the Westpac case was decided? That's correct. But you wouldn't agree to that? No. But nevertheless, the negotiations over the EU took through until, again, July of 2018? That's correct. And what was the community benefit payment that 
CBA agreed to? The same, 1.25 million. Do you have any idea what sort of civil penalty you might have obtained had you gone to court? Um, we hadn't got advice in relation to that. Um, you, you know, our view is that the civil penalty, depending on the case that we brought, um, wouldn't have been particularly significant. You know, it wouldn't have been, for instance, in the um, uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars. And I, I should add, for us, this wasn't a penalty case. It was about stopping the conduct, and we stopped the conduct. Would it have been worthwhile to ASIC and perhaps to the entire community to know whether a court thought that offering superannuation in conjunction with administering a questionnaire about a person's financial situation amounted to personal financial advice? We, we consider that the general deterrence um, outcome of the EU's, you know, that met the general deterrence. It's, it's indicated that ASIC has said that this is not conduct that um, is acceptable. And as I say, we have a matter before the courts that's testing out the proposition of where is the line between general and personal advice. And that will give us, you know, the, court in the court's view. This is a matter that's untested, um, and, but we now have a test case. But testing out a different part of the line. Well, you know, and as I indicated before, there's all different bits of conduct. Every time we look at matters that come to us for investigation, they can be different. Um, and taking each and every one of those to court to test propositions um, is not an effective regulation. It's not effective. Do you know whether any assessment was made of whether a consumer whether there was consumer harm as a consequence of members being switched into ANZ or CBA's superannuation product? We did um, do some work in relation to that. Um, and, um, well, I should say, first of all, our concern and the reason that we wanted this to stop is that we were concerned that there could be um, significant consumer harm, um, in particular in relation to um, uh, customers or consumers that rolled over superannuation. Um, and in that sense, they may have rolled into from a low fee fund into a higher fee uh, fund, or they may have um, had some loss of insurance. Um, so that was a real concern for us and why we wanted this conduct to, to stop. Um, we did do some assessment as part of our preparation for proceedings to try and ascertain whether in fact there was um, real prejudice, real harm, and the results of that were relatively equivocal. Um, you know, it wasn't clear that there was harm. Some people, in fact, had gone into a lower fee-paying fund than, than they were in previously. Um, we looked at a lot of complaints data, I think it, um, from one of the banks, and I, I can't recall which one which indicated that a lot of people were concerned that they were overinsured, that, that they didn't want this insurance that they were now getting. Um, and that in itself, you know, may raise concerns. Um, we were concerned about what the causation of any particular harm or prejudice might be. What we found is that um, some people's decisions were made well after to roll into the fund, were well, made well after they'd opened the actual um, superannuation account. So there, all those issues um, uh, uh, arose through our work um, and you know, we, we were concerned, but we weren't able to point to um, a significant sort of body of harm or body of loss, let's say. Do you agree with me that in order to know whether there would be a significant body of loss, it would be necessary to do a lot of further work and analysis. Um, yeah, and, it, and it's uh, analysis and work that might take years and years and years because some of it might not eventuate until well down the track. We were certainly alive to that, which is, uh, I don't want to say it again, but 
That's why we wanted it to stop. But so in your enforceable undertaking, there's no requirement on either ANZ or CBA to undertake that analysis? No, that wasn't, that wasn't the focus. Remediation wasn't the focus in this particular um, project. As you know, remediation is a focus in a range of other wealth management project matters. Do you think that superannuation is a product that should be sold in bank branches? Me personally. Do you have a role at ASIC in relation to the sale of financial products? Do you think? I, 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 I've never turned my mind to it. I think a product such as that could be available um, in a bank. We need to have people engaged in superannuation. Um, there's a role to be played. It just needs to be done in a manner that is in accordance with the law. And it doesn't lead people to think that the bank is taking into account their personal needs and objectives and circumstances um, before they make some form of recommendation or mention a fund. So yes, I think it can be done. I think it can be done, um, but a lot of care needs to be taken. I don't Engage that in oh, sorry, Mr. I was Miller. gonna say, engagement in super is a very important thing, and ASIC promotes that constantly. I don't have any further questions. Are the documents of 3 October 17 in evidence already? No, Commissioner, I tend to those documents. The email uh, of 3 October 17, ANZ 800 9730589 and accompanying draft enforceable undertaking, ANZ 800 9730590 together, exhibit 5.316. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Yes, Mr. Collinson. Just one matter, if the Commissioner pleases. Um, Mr Mullally, uh, the hypothesis, as I understand it, that was being put to you by council assisting was to draw a comparison between the position ASIC might be in if instead of entering into an enforceable undertaking with ANZ, it had commenced a court proceeding against ANZ in May 2017. Yes. Do you recall those questions? Yes. Now, uh, the Westpac proceeding involves similar sorts of issues, doesn't it? It's a similar sized case. Um, Commissioner, sorry. Mr. Moment. Yes, Ms. Ms. Carlson. don't need much persuasion that uh, uh, it would not be appropriate to prejudge the matter. I had not understood the, uh, the question as doing more than inviting comparison between uh, size of one actual piece of litigation and size of uh, a hypothetical piece of litigation. Now, if the question's understood in that way, is there a difficulty about it, Ms Neskovshin? Yeah, now, yes, that, have, that, I, have I got the, uh, the idea right? You certainly have, Commissioner. Yes. I think you may have answered, Mr Mullally, but I was simply arguing, asking you whether this hypothetical ANZ proceeding, um, do I misspeak somewhere there? This hypothetical uh, ANZ proceeding was of a similar scope um, and scale to the actual Westpac proceeding. Yes. Yeah. And it certainly involves similar legal issues. Yes, we believe so. Now, that proceeding, uh, as you gave evidence, was commenced in December 2016? That's correct. I'm told the trial was February 2018? That's correct. Uh, and as of today, there's judgment reserved, That's correct. which is August 2018. Counting forward from that, uh, I get 20 months, uh, if one looks at the Westpac proceeding, to a position where uh, as at today, there is no resolution of ASIC's concerns in relation to the conduct of Westpac. Um, uh, what I would say is there's no um, court determination. Um, I just hesitate to say that I, I, I'm not sure exactly what Westpac are doing right at the moment. So 
Um, I, thank you for that. They may well have taken their own counsel on that. Yes. Um, now, if we assumed a, a roughly similar or, or order of events, if you'd simply um, been the tough guy and uh, decided not to engage with, West, uh, with ANZ, then roughly speaking, one might think that the court proceeding against ANZ would have commenced in May 2017. There would have been a, uh, a trial uh, in about uh, July 2018. And um, by January 2019, which we haven't arrived at yet, one would be in a position of an unreserved judgment. I want to ask you... Do we get to a question, Mr Collinson, after this <laughs> Well, it might, might be in a submission, Your Honour, so I think it's fair to put to the witness. Um, I just want to ask you, what, what, what would you uh, regard as the more satisfactory position to be in as at today if one compares what you achieved at ASIC with ANZ, that is an, an enforceable undertaking in July 2018, uh, versus a reserved judgment in a case against uh, uh, ANZ as at January 2019? Well, certainly we prefer to have, and we think it's better for consumers that the matter's resolved, and we think it's better for general deterrence. Um, now, uh, council assisting sought to characterise your um, May 2017 communication to ANZ about ASIC's intention to issue proceedings as a bluff, um, you might have responded to that, but just for clarity, what do you disagree or agree with that characterisation? It's part of our negotiations, but we would have commenced the proceeding if we hadn't had the response. And is it the case that the enforcement committee within ASIC had authorised the institution of proceedings against uh, I, ANZ? I, I believe so. No further questions. Yes, thank you. Is there anything arising? Nothing arising. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mullally. You may step down and you're excused.